For 40 years, Denmark has led the world in wind, which now makes up 20% of their electricity. Welcome to turbine number four. Come on in. So what I'm going to do now is to press the stop button. Oh, you, you, you can have the oh, responsibility. Absolutely. Stopping the turbine. Oh, I can hear it. It just grinds down very quickly. Yeah. Just a few seconds. Let's climb to the top. How high are we going? It's 50 meters. How narrow do we get at the top? Oh, like uh, one and a half meter. OK. All right. OK. One important thing is use your legs. The benefits of wind are many. It produces a lot of power. Right. Uh, it's fast to install and scalable in, in, in size. Um, it does not produce CO2 while producing power. Mm -hmm. Uh, to Denmark, it's also a big export uh, commodity. So, so for us, there's, there's some additional benefits. Sure. In Denmark, we sort of invented the modern turbine. It was built by a combination of hardworking entrepreneurs and some visionary politicians who could see this already in the beginning, 20, 30 years ago. And of course, the consumers, me, and my, at that time, my, my parents, I guess, uh, they had to pay the price for wind energy. Right. So for a while, you could say we were, other things being equal, paying more than we could have done, mm -hmm. but to build up this industry and to make sure that in the future, Denmark would reduce its dependency of, on imported energy. We went from 0% of wind uh, penetration to 20% or 22 as we're approaching now. Slowly but surely, uh, it has been a long but concerted effort. Every year, one bit at a time. Whoa. Woo. You like the view? Awesome. It's a well-known Danish concept for wind turbines. Right. Which is just to use standard, simple components, almost taken from the shelf. Sure. It, it takes care of itself. This, this fellow works for sure. 20 years or more. Very reliable. Very, Pretty very simple reliable. components. Very simple, yeah. Keep it simple. The three-blade turbine we see around the world was pioneered and perfected here. They can be built in months and rolled out in any number. But the turbine is only part of the equation. The rest is the wind. And of course, when the wind does not blow, we generate nothing. That we guarantee. One of the problems with wind is its intermittency. The wind doesn't blow all the time, and so you don't get the electricity from wind all the time. Uh, and again, because it's hard to store electricity, you need to figure out how to handle that intermittency. The main idea is a combination of different technologies, diversification. That's what we have done in Denmark. We have our combined heat and power plants that are stable, base load, and then we have our strong interconnectors to the other countries. Okay. That's crucial. You cannot do this without being able to exchange large amounts of electricity across borders. Exactly. Denmark has made this intermittent resource a success. But this is a country of only 5 million people. All their turbines combined would power just 340,000 people per year. Can we do the same thing in a much larger country? But this sort of shows you in Texas what's going on, so you get a relative sense of where you are. Yeah. Which means as soon as you take off, you're flying over 25% of U.S. wind energy capacity huh. is here. Basically, half of U.S. wind is probably within 500 miles of here. Let's do it. I'm ready. <laughs> got almost 100,000 acres in the Roscoe wind farm. 100,000 acres. And about 400 landowners. And this amazing wind resource that we've got through here. 
Did you ever think you'd be using the word amazing wind? Oh, we we <laughs> cuss this wind all our life. <laughs> it destroys our crops. We have sandstorms. It blows our soil away. <laughs> And, and you talk about it, uh, an, an attitude adjustment. Now we've had it, 180 degree attitude adjustment yeah. relating to the wind. It's right. just been phenomenal. You really led this thing in many ways, and I know you're a modest person, but four or five years ago, if I was standing right here with you, we'd be looking at farmland and ranch right. land. The more I learned about the wind industry, the more I believed that we had the combination that we needed to build a wind farm here. It just, uh, somebody just needed to do it. And this is a community that's welcoming this with open arms. Yes. Not, nobody's yes. saying, hey, not here in my backyard, not no, on my farm. No, no. West Texas is an agriculturally depressed area. It's just a economically depressed area. Yeah. And we've just had to sit here and take what Mother Nature yeah. brings to us in the way of rainfall and try to make a living on this country. And it's gotten so tough that uh, our young people don't come back. But now, with our windmills and our opportunities here that, they're, that it's bringing, it's, it's turned our communities around. We've got, for the first time ever, these, yeah. these landlords have an opportunity to receive a regular paycheck. For the farmers around Sweetwater, wind turbines are a beautiful thing, and I would tend to agree. But to get 20% of U.S. electricity from wind would require another 200,000 of them. We could do that, but people may not want to look at that many turbines. Wind power is best in windy areas, but people don't tend to live there. And so we need to get the electrical grid out to the wind farms uh, in order to be able to bring that electricity into the cities. We found the best wind areas, and then we came up with a plan to build transmission out to those areas and deliver it back in to Dallas-Fort Worth, Austin, San Antonio, and Houston. Okay. That plan is 2,300 miles of high-capacity transmission. It's about $5 billion, <laughs> and we're going to have it completed by the end of 2013. What would it take to do that nationally? Just scale it up for me a little bit. Well, there are two yeah. debates on this. Okay. One is, who pays for it? So would we encourage, in the, at the federal level, a payment system like we have today, which is everybody pays, which is different mm -hmm. from the way the rest of the country does? And then there's the siting issue. Nobody wants to have transmission lines running through their 100-year-old family ranch. Right. That's never been the case. This is going to be the challenge if the federal government says, okay, we're going to do that. We're going to cite these lines. Are they really willing to get down and go property by property right. with county judges, county commissioners, and landowners in citing these lines? Because that's what's required. Right. So to make wind work on a grand scale, we'll first need to figure out transmission, and then how to manage that much intermittent power. I went to visit ERCOT, where they've been doing exactly that. This building is natural disaster proof. This is designed right. to handle an F5 tornado, which is the biggest tornado we anticipate. You know, we're unique in that we have enough diesel generators to actually supply all the power we need 24 hours a day indefinitely. 22 million people that were <laughs> relying on our power, we can't have little things like that happen. Right. Is that your grid? Yes, th this is a, a graphical representation of our grid, and the different lines are the different voltages that we have in the system. But if you look at a power plant, you can see the power flowing out on the different lines. The amazing thing about electricity is it's generated at exactly the same pace that we use it. Like, yeah. isn't that a miracle? Yeah. I mean, what other thing, you know, exactly where supply meets demand? We take it for granted, we flip a switch, uh, light comes on, but actually uh, somebody is uh, and very short time intervals, uh, so-called dispatching different plants, right. gas plants, nuclear plants, coal plants, yeah. wind plants, uh, to match the instantaneous 
demand. So I've got Houston, San Antonio, Austin, Dallas, Fort Worth. That's right. That's right. And then the wind, our wind is out here in the west. And these, these are some of those big lines that we're moving out there to connect to the, the west Texas wind. If you look at this chart here, this is how we actually use electricity. And you can see that at 3 o'clock in the morning is our, is our minimum usage. And then all day long, it increases up to about 5 o'clock where it peaks out, which is mainly your air conditioning load. And then it repeats itself day after day. Okay. And now let's take a look at wind. Uh, the wind output does not match the actual energy usage. So because of this intermittent resource, when, when the demand is going up but the wind is going down, that causes us to bring on additional conventional generation that can make up the difference between the actual renewables output and what our demand is. Gotcha. Wind is intermittent. Yeah. Solar is intermittent. So when they're going, they're great. But you need something you can bring up quickly to fill in that gap. 